a day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what gossip is? It's just talking about how good you are compared to everybody else's mistakes. Let me tell you, you sorry thing. You've messed up just like everybody else. Show mercy. Show love. Show compassion. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. I just, I just felt like exhorting for a minute. Couldn't help it. When the Spirit of the Lord shows up, anything's possible. Amen. Hallelujah. Take your attention to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read through a passage here and then we're going to, amen, teach on what I feel the Lord has led me to teach on here today, minister on. My title today, if I were to have a title, uh, is His Mission, Our Purpose. Everybody say, His Mission, mission. Our Purpose. purpose. We're going to talk about our purpose today. Amen. Anybody feel like you have a purpose? Let me ask that again. Does anybody want to have a purpose? How many of you are thankful that you have a purpose? Amen. Praise God. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Somebody say all things. All things. Why don't you shout it out? All things. All things. There you go. All things. Not, not some things, but all things. That pertain unto life and godliness. Somebody say life and godliness. Life Aren't you thankful that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness? Amen. Hallelujah. That's a, that's a positive word right there. Through the knowledge of him. That hath called us. Everybody say called us. Anybody called today? Anybody called today? (laughs) There's a calling on your life today. Who has called us. To glory and virtue. Think about it. He has called us to glory and virtue. Now, there's a word for you that's, that's not used too much today. Virtue. We've been called to virtue. What is virtue? Whereby are given unto us exceeding and great, exceeding great, think about it, and precious promises. Are the promises of God precious to you today? Are they great to you today? Exceeding great. Nothing compares to these promises. Exceeding great and precious, valuable promises. That by these you might be partakers, think about it, of the divine nature. Wow. Peter's just unfolding some stuff in this house today. Oh, hallelujah. I I just get inspired reading it. You mean we can overcome? We can be a part of the divine? I'm telling you, if you've got these things, you're going to win. Oh, hallelujah. Woo. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Escaped the corruption. Oh, man, I'm telling you. The things of God make this world pale and look like dirt in comparison. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. What does it mean to be diligent? That's another word that's not appreciated in this society. You know what? The word is just countercultural. So we need to, we need to quit trying to be uh, culturally relevant. 
And we need to start being Christ relevant. Christ has his own culture. And it will never mesh with this world's culture. We need a Christ culture in the church. In fact, we need, to, we need to take Christ culture and bring it to the world. Add to your faith virtue. We'll talk about virtue today. And to virtue, knowledge. Amen. And to knowledge, temperance, self-control, self-regulation. And to temperance... Patience. What did he say? He said, giving all diligence. This is the work that we have to do on ourselves. Say, on me. I got to work on me. And to patience, godliness. We're to be godly. And to godliness, crown it, brotherly kindness. Now, now we're getting to the pinnacle of Christianity. And to brotherly kindness, charity, or love. The apex of a Christian character. For if these things be in you and abound, which we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, they make you that you shall neither be barren, which is four things that cannot be satisfied, and one of them is the barren womb, Barrenness should drive you crazy. Barrenness should be a, an emptiness. Any woman that wants a baby and can't have a baby understands how barrenness can make you desire something with great desire. And he says, if you have these things, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know him, you know what Jesus said to the people that are not going to make it? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. If you want to know him, you got to be fruitful in the knowledge. You got to know him. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Not physically. And cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. When we don't love our brothers anymore, when we have a problem with the church, we're we're short-sighted. We're nearsighted. You're going to run into stuff and hurt yourself. Because you forgot how much God forgave you. Right? Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence. There it is again. To make, everybody say your calling. An election. Everybody say your election. election. Sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. I want you to think about the power of that verse right there. If you do these things, somebody say you'll never fall. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place so strong. For an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You want a door into heaven? This is your doorway into heaven. My God. He said it at the beginning. He said it in the first verse. We've obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. Not through our righteousness. But the things that we do in our lives open the door to the kingdom. How many of you want to reach your full potential in the kingdom of God? 
How many of you want to abound in fruitfulness in the kingdom of God? Does anybody, does, is anybody hungry? Amen. Is anybody desperate? Does anybody, I wonder if there's any zealous, passionate people in here that say, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of done with what the world's got to offer. I just want to have the fullness of the kingdom of God. I, I, want, I want that entrance to be ministered unto me. I want that, ki- that entrance to be ministered to me into the everlasting kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Praise God. Why don't we thank the Lord for his calling. Amen. And let's give him glory before we're seated today. Amen. And can we pray that God would minister unto us? Bishop, would you just pray over us right now? Amen. Can we pray that God would open up our spirits to receive whatever he has? He can speak to us today. Would you let him speak into your heart today? Lord Jesus, we're asking for that anointing that only you can give. Anointing on your messenger, Father, to be used to speak the word and will of God to us. And an anointing upon us to hear, to receive, to understand, and to do the things that you want us to do. Bless today, God, your people. Bless this congregation with the ability to receive. Come, Lord, your servants listening. Hallelujah. Let's thank God for what he's going to do in advance. Thank you, Jesus, for your word, for the will of God that's going to be accomplished today in Jesus' name. I have great expectation for what you're going to do today. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, What is a vision? The Bible says without a vision, the people cast off restraint. They perish. Do you have a vision for your life? Uh, You need a vision for your life if you don't. What is a vision? What is a mission? Calvary has a vision and a mission statement. And and we're we're open. This church is uh, a church that welcomes everybody, anybody. There's room at Calvary. There's room in the house of God for everybody. Anybody can be a part of the church if they want to be. But but you gotta you got to be a part of the church in uh, more ways than just church attendance. You have to, com- the Bible says, compact yourself into the body. And so, so we have a vision and we have a mission statement. And uh, what is a, what's the difference between a vision and a mission? First of all, what is a vision? What's a vision? What is a vision? Does anybody know what a vision is? Without a vision, you're going to die. So what is a vision? I'll tell you what a vision is. Vision is something you can see. A vision is something you've got your eyes locked on. A vision is something you're focused on. A vision is something, first of all, we call it vision for a reason. Because you can see where you're going. You know where you're headed. Amen. How many of you want a vision for your life? You want to see the destination, your mark that you're heading towards. Amen. How are you going to get where you need to go? Well, as every person knows in this place today, how many of you use Rand McNally? How many of you don't even know what Rand McNally is? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. If we ever wanted to go on a vacation, you know what we did? We'd pull Rand McNally out. Anybody remember Rand McNally? Pull out Rand McNally. Dad had Rand McNally stuffed down in the side of that old Astro Ford van. Aerostar. Aerostar. And we, we pull Rand McNally out. And how many of you remember the good old days when you had to memorize every road, you didn't know the speed limits, and you would end up on roads and you'd be wondering, where in the world am I? And you'd stop on the side of the road and you'd pull Rand McNally out. Thank God. For GPS. Our, our young people don't even know what a map is. Geography is, has become a thing of the past. You just punch in where you want to go. What is it about a GPS, amen, that makes it so special? Ha, <laughs> I heard it. You know what a GP, you know, you know, if you're going to find your way somewhere on a GPS, you know what you need to know, number one? I hear a lot of mixed, mixed reviews out here. We're getting like a 3.5 star on this message right now. You got to know where you're at. You can't know where you're going to go until you know where you're at. 
You know what a GPS tells you? You are here. Then you can put your destination in. You can put a destination in all you want, but if you don't put your current position, you're not going anywhere. And so a GPS identifies you're here, you want to go here. I went to, I went to, we went to Colorado Springs. Now, how many of you have been to Denver? It's like an 11 hour drive. Did you know that you can do it in less than 11 hours? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because you don't have to go to Salina, Kansas. I mean, who wants to go to God forbid, God forsaken Salina, Kansas? There's nothing in Kansas except open, flat, nothing. And a powerful church. I mean, other than that, there's no reason to go to Kansas except for the corn and the cows. Amen. No, no, God bless Kansas. We love Kansas. But, oh, come on. We're just having fun. Uh, we love Kansas. We love the people in Kansas. Amen. And we love our baptistry. It's got a cricket in the baptistry. That's all right. Uh, and so you, 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 can go, you can go a different direction because the GPS can actually take you away that's faster. I think we made it in nine and a half hours. And, uh, and one of those roads was a dirt road. We still did good. And so thank God for, for the GPS. But I, I want you to understand today that uh, God has a plan and a direction for your life. But you got to have a vision, and a vision starts with you're here, and you want to go there. Okay? Now, what is a mission? <laughs> I hope we have a mission. Uh, you know, if you're going to go to war, you're going to go on a mission. What's a mission? If you're going to do something, you're going to, you know what a mission is? A mission is, what are we going to do? A vision is, what do we see? A mission is, what are we going to do about it? It's a goal. A mission is an activity or a purpose or a, or a job on how we're going to accomplish and reach our objective. So your mission, amen, and your vision are essential to accomplishing your purpose. How many of you know Jesus had a mission statement for his life and a vision statement for his life? Jesus said this in Luke 19 and 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus had a vision. Now, did he accomplish that vision? He didn't fully save everything that was lost, but he made sure everything that was lost had an opportunity to be saved. His vision was so big that he could not accomplish it in his lifetime. But he had to pass it on to 12 men to fulfill his vision. Your vision from God is going to be bigger than your lifetime. And if you don't have something that you're living into the future for, if you're not passing something on to your kids and your grandkids, your vision's not big enough. If your vision is for your bass boat, shame on you. I'm going to say it again. If your vision is for your shotgun, shame on you. Because you're not passing something on that's eternal. If your vision is for dresses, picked on the guys, let's pick on the ladies. If your vision is temporary, if your vision is for food, you got a very short-term vision. Now, not picking on you right now. I'm trying to help us understand that we can get so focused, there's nothing wrong, by the way, with any of the above or following, but if that's our vision for life, we're short-sighted. We're missing our purpose. We were not created, if we were created, to enjoy um, just pleasure, then, uh, then we wouldn't have to work. But apparently, we've got to work. You know what we work for? We don't work for all the pleasures in life. We work to take care of our family, to put food on the table, and to serve other people. We, we work, we serve, we minister, not so we can better our lives, but so that we can better everyone's life. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm teaching Christ culture today. You, I don't care what the culture of the world says today. I'm just going to quit apologizing for, for what America thinks. And I'm just going to teach Christ culture today because it's counterculture. 
and it's all right. It's right. Amen. It's the kind of culture that's going to make America great. It's the kind of culture that's going to make the church great. It's going to make any nation great that embraces it. It's the word of God. And so Jesus had, everybody shout, a vision. vision. He also had a mission. He said in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Amen. To preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Go back to this verse here in 18. Notice none of these things are really what the world can offer. When he says poor, he's not talking about people that have low income. He's talking about people that are poor in spirit. They, they lack what they need and the world cannot provide it for them. I've come to preach the gospel, so apparently the gospel makes you rich. Amen. So not in earthly riches, it makes you rich in your spirit, in, your, in you, who you are as an individual. I'd rather have my soul saved than own everything on earth. What does it profit a man if he ha- gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? And what does it gain a man if he, pro- if, you know what? If you have Jesus, if you have the gospel, you've got more than anything this world can offer you. That doesn't mean that you don't have to work to gain more, but in the spiritual, you're broke if you don't have the gospel. Send me to heal the brokenhearted. You can't see broken hearts. People don't walk around with cracked hearts on their chest outside. Maybe they do now. I don't know. But uh, they kind of do wear their feelings on their sleeve. But they, 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 they don't show physically. So what do you do? Jesus says, I see your broken heart. And I've come to heal the brokenhearted. The things that are unseen. The things that are below the surface. To preach deliverance to the captives. Not people in prison bars, but to preach deliverance to those that are bound by sin, that are oppressed of the enemy, that are captivated by darkness, that are enslaved by their own works of unrighteousness. I've come to set captives free. Preach deliverance, amen, to the captives. Notice the preaching of the gospel and the preaching of the word of God sets people free. That's why we need more preachers on the earth. Yes, we do. We need more preachers. We need more men and women answering the call of God to preach the gospel. And recovering of sight to the blind. Not physically blind. People aren't walking around everywhere blind. He says, I'm coming to set those that are bound by darkness free. Recovery of sight to the blind. How many of you recognize how blind you were when you weren't serving God? You were walking around totally blind. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes, the preaching of the gospel comes, and you're seeing a whole new world. You're seeing things you've never seen before because the preaching of the gospel brings sight to the blind. And set at liberty those that are bruised. What is a bruise? What is a bruise? It's a wound that's underneath the surface. A bruise is when something gets broken or bruised beneath the surface. Anybody had a bruise and then somebody come up and poked you in your bruise? They didn't see that bruise, but boy, it hurt. You know what? There's a lot of hurts in people's lives. There's a lot of bruised people in this world today. On the outside, they look normal, but on the inside, they're hurting. And every time somebody touches that place in your life, it hurts, doesn't it? That's a bruise. And Jesus says, I'm going to free you from that. Don't embrace your bruises. Don't let your past hurts become pets. Your pet problem. Oh, yes. People, people give you so much compassion because you've been hurt. Would, can we quit showing? Suck it up, first of all. Second of all, let Jesus deal with it. Let Jesus give you liberty. He can free you. He can completely loose you from the power of past hurt and bruises. You can't see it. Amen. 
but he can deliver you from it. And Jesus said, I see all these things. And I've come to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee. It's the year that all debts were released. Anything you had done wrong and you had, you had made a bad business deal, you, you could perform a transaction, got you into debt, you had to take out a loan, and that loan was based on a series of years. The year of Jubilee, 50 years, was the year everybody's debts went free and everyone got their property returned to them. It literally was the way God set the economy up so that Israel would never become broke and never, never fail financially. They would always have their inheritance. And he says, I'm going to give you your inheritance back. I'm going to give you what belongs to you back. And I'm going to free you of all of the debts you have incurred because of bad decisions. Or because of circumstances. Or because the rain didn't come when you thought it was going to come and you lost your harvest. This was, this was God's plan, amen, to make sure everybody got their freedom back. And the spiritual jubilee is that God gives us our life and our authority and our power and our dominion and our supernatural victory back. And he says, you know what? Everything you've done wrong and you've lost through the work of the enemy and through life and the mistakes you've made, I'm going to reverse it all and I'm going to reinstate you back into that position of inheritance and power and glory and honor. And you can be proud of who you are and not ashamed of who you are. The pre Preaching of the gospel raises people and elevates people to a position of authority and blessing. Okay? And so this was Jesus' mission. His vision was, I'm here to seek and save all, I'm here to reach the world. You know what? We have a vision and a mission, and it's in alignment. We got to align ourselves in submission to Jesus. We have a submission. We got a submission. It's not, it's not our mission. It's not our plan. It's not our idea. We're in submission to Christ. And whatever Christ is doing, we submit ourselves as, and we have a submission. It's underneath and subordinate to his mission. It's so important that we submit ourselves to him. Because we cannot accomplish his mission unless we are fully submitted to our commander, to our chief commander to our to the captain of our souls to the one who leads the battle we must be in submission so that we can accomplish the work that we have to do mission is what we're accomplishing it's jesus mission he had a mission statement for the world or for the church excuse me in matthew 28 19 he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to some of the people to americans Go preach the gospel in English. Go preach the gospel in Spanish only. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Did you know that the gospel works in every language? Do you know the gospel is not just in English? Contrary to American belief. Or some beliefs. Did you know that Jesus wasn't white? American? English speaking? Jesus was a Jew, olive-skinned, dark hair, tall and handsome. Uh, it kind of looked like me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joking. My wife will get on to me for that later. She hates it when I say stuff like that. I'm just joking. Jesus was a Jew, unlike me. <laughs> and Jesus preached it's not just for the Jews. You got a mission. Take the gospel to the world. Take it to Africa. Take it to China. Take it to Europe. Take it to America. Take it to South America. Take it to Australia. He died for the world. He didn't just die for a certain group of people. He died for humanity. I'm so thankful that we're a part of a multi. You just look around this building. Amen. We're not one type of people. We represent every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every language. I'm so glad that the church is multicultural. I'm so glad that the church is not racist, segregated, divided by color, divided by language. Amen. But we are one people in Christ. Amen. 
all nations need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It works to the Muslims. It works to those, amen, that are in Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Amen. We can preach the gospel in Lebanon. We can preach the gospel to the ends of the world. And we are supposed to. Because we have a mission. Preach the gospel to every nation. Don't try to go preach the gospel in Iran. If you're not willing to preach the gospel in your neighborhood. Don't come to me saying I'm going to be a missionary and do great things. If you can't even talk to the person at Walmart. Come on, we got a mission, and it's reach the world. It's take everybody that we can with us to heaven, and until Jesus comes, we're going to fulfill that mission. Amen. Amen. He repeated that mission. Multiple gospels, three gospels, have parallel stories that say the same thing. Baptize them. It's our responsibility. Baptize them in the name, not names plural. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. You take all those prepositional phrases out and it says baptize them in the name. It just says baptize them. But in the name of Jesus Christ is how we baptize. Teaching them to observe. You don't just stop with baptism. You don't just get people baptized then you drop them and move on. No, no. You teach them. To observe, to obey, to listen, to adhere to, to embrace, to to become disciples. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That was Christ's mission for the church. We call it the great commission. We We call it the commission. Why is it called the commission? Because it was Christ's mission for the church. And it's a co-mission because it's our mission and it's his mission tied together. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We have a commission. We got a mission. Amen. Now, Calvary has a mission, a vision statement. And uh, our, our vision statement is loving God and people in spirit and truth. Our goal is we want to reach the world. And we cannot reach the world if we don't love God and love people in spirit and in truth. Now, you can love people. Anybody can love people. Love, 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 love. How many love songs are there? Love's not the problem. It's loving in spirit and in truth. If it doesn't harmonize with spirit and truth, then it doesn't harmonize with what we're passionate about. We are going to be passionate about the things that God is passionate about. We are going to be in in conformity to the things that God wants us to be in conformity to. We're not going to let this world determine what our passions are. We're going to let Jesus determine what our passions are. And so we are passionate and we are in love with God and we love people in spirit and in truth. We're letting the spirit of God lead us and we're letting the word of God be our foundation. And we cannot deviate from that because if we do, we can be nice to people, but we don't help change their lives. We're to be nice. Did you know you're supposed to be nice to people? Did you know you're supposed to like tax collectors? IRS agents. Jesus loved IRS agents. It was shouting material before. Now it's just... You know you're supposed to love sinners? You know you're supposed to be kind to sinners? Did you know you're just supposed to be a nice person? No? Some of y'all are saying, get back to the preaching. (laughs) I am preaching. If you're not nice, you're not like Jesus. I'm preaching to myself too. You know, you got to be nice to your HOA president. I receive it, Lord. (laughs) Love God. Love people. Get your attitude out of the way. 
embrace what Peter talked about, long-suffering, patience, gentleness, godliness, self-control, and treat people like you're trying to win them to God and take them to heaven with you. Treat people like you want to be in heaven with them forever. It's good preaching. Amen. We also have a mission statement. Our mission statement, as many of you could probably quote, what is it? Man, that's pretty cool. Just about everybody here knows our mission. Now, if you know your mission, obviously you've been through CTI and you had to memorize the mission statement. How many of you went through CTI and had to memorize the mission statement? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. But the problem is most of you didn't hear me teach the lesson, so now you get to hear me teach the lesson. (laughs) Helping hurting people. You know why we exist? We exist. You know, Jesus said, he said, I didn't come. Excuse me. He said, those that are well, they don't need a physician. Those that are sick need a physician. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I just got a question. What hurts people? Now, all y'all that know, shh. What hurts people? What hurts people? Good job. What hurts people? I'm sorry. Sin hurts people. Sin hurts people. Jesus said, if you're sick, you need to repent. I didn't come to call the righteous. Those that are well don't need a physician, but those that are sick. He's the great physician. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. You know why people are hurting? That's right. They're hurting because of sin. Sin breaks us. People didn't hurt people. People's sin hurt people. When you speak to somebody and you curse them and you tell them to go where and do what and have what, and you sin. Because you didn't speak life. You cursed a fellow man and that's sin. Sin hurts people. Quit sinning. Quit hurting people. Quit sinning. Sin hurts people, and we got to treat people like we want to be treated. Literally, the Bible says that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You don't hurt yourself. You don't tell, be, now if you beat yourself up, quit beating yourself up. Quit talking down about yourself so you can see yourself in a better light and you can treat other people in a better light. You generally reflect who you are and how you view yourself onto others. If you treat other people bad, you have a bad self-image. That's proven psychological fact. Sorry. But if you're mean to people, it's because you're mean to yourself. Quit being mean to yourself. Give yourself a break. Amen. Quit thinking you're so perfect. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, Mission. Helping hurting people. So what hurts people? Sin. You know what gospel does? The gospel transforms people's lives. If we want to truly help people, we need to preach repentance. If we want to truly help people, we're going to preach, you got to turn from your wickedness. You know what John the Baptist came preaching? Repent. Repent. He preached the baptism of repentance. He baptized them unto repentance. He said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Prove to me you've changed your ways. Repent. You know what Jesus came preaching? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Believe the gospel. You know what preaching of repentance does? It heals people. When we preach the gospel of repentance, people turn from sin. And all of a sudden, their life gets better. Come on, church. We need more preachers preaching repentance. We don't need to be afraid of preaching repentance. We need to preach repentance. It's the core tenet of our belief. you got to repent. You got to repent. It's the first thing you got to do when you come to God is turn from your wickedness. Everybody knows that. 
almost. Used to, changing. Now people think you can do whatever you want and still have Jesus. Well, Jesus loves you regardless of what you do. But he's also a just judge. And he will judge unrighteousness. So we are to help hurting people reach their full potential in Christ by serving with excellence. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. How many of you know the story of the Good Samaritan? How many of you have never heard the story of the Good Samaritan? Never heard it. Raise your hand. Never heard the story of the Good Samaritan. All right, good. I get to tell a new story today. It's exciting. All right. Jesus told parables. And a parable is a story that's not true. It's not an it's not a actual story. It's a, it's a story. Okay? It's a, it's, it's a fiction. But it has a... It's a real life example uh, of what, of a spiritual truth. And, and some of Jesus' parables were just like one sentence. And every word in that parable was important. Every single word. And so every word has a spiritual parallel to it. And so when you read through this story, every word has spiritual parallel to it. So Jesus answered and he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at, that pla at the place, he came and he looked at him, and he passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now this is the story Jesus tells. And this guy is asking who his neighbor is. You know, this wise, uh, this, this lawyer uh, who's, who's accomplished everything in the Bible, right? And he said, who's my neighbor? I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus asks him, he says, who was his neighbor in that? Who was the neighbor of him that fell among thieves? And they replied and said, well, it was the guy that helped him. The guy that helped him was his neighbor. It wasn't the guy that lived in the next zip code address next to him. It was the guy that reached down and helped his wounds. Okay? Now, let's go back and look at this story. Number one, we need to understand that this man was going from Jerusalem. A certain man, this individual, this man was going from Jerusalem to where? Back up to that verse, if you would. He's going to Jericho. From Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the mountain of God. It's the uh, holy city Jerusalem and it's a type of the church it's where the name of God is it's the city of worship it's where the temple was and so he's going from the house of God worship and a place of, of blessing and prosperity and he's heading where down every time you leave the house of God to pursue after other opportunities you're going down and he's going down to Jericho. Now, what does Jericho represent? Where else do we see Jericho in our Bible? The walls of Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And the walls came. You can talk about good old Gideon. Okay. Brother Sullivan's coming back to me. Amen. Children's ministry. <laughs> Jericho was the city that, that Israel came to. It was a fortress. And God told Joshua, you march around that wall for seven days and it's going to fall when you shout. And Joshua took salt and he sowed salt on Jericho. And he said, curse be the man that build, rebuilds this city. Let him build the foundation in his son and his gates, set his gates in his next son. He literally said he's going to lose his children. To build this city. That's exactly what happened. They set the foundation. He lost his boy. Set the next gates. He lost his other son. This man who rebuilt Jer Jericho was cursed. Jericho was cursed. Jericho means fragrance. The world is always going to try to get your attention. The pleasures of sin are for a season. 
The world is always going to try to attract you with its fragrance. It's going to tell you there's good things out here. But when you leave the house of God, you start going down. And he's headed down. To, and on his way to this place, the attractions of the world have got his attention. And on the way down, he fell. Every time you leave the house of God and you go after other stuff, no, you're going to fall. And he fell among thieves. You know what the thief has come to do? He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And he leaves and he's headed down to Jer Jericho and he falls among thieves. And you know what they do? The first thing the devil wants to do when he gets a hold of your life is he's going to take your clothes off. He robbed him of his raiment. And we know that the church is clothed with the white robe of righteousness. And the first thing the devil wants to do is strip you of your righteousness. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves and they tried to cover it up. But God said, you know what? That's not good enough. Here's some, here's some animal skins. Here's a sacrifice to cover up your nakedness. And he covered their nakedness and their shame. And the first thing that happens when somebody leaves the church and the house of God is they begin to live a life that's filled with sin and they lose their righteousness and they're ashamed of themselves. And shame came upon him and he's naked. And then it says, and they beat him. They bruised him. The devil's not interested in making you feel good. He's going to beat you up. Sin will hurt you. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you there longer than you want to stay. And make you pay more than you ever intended to pay. Why? Because sin is an abuser. Sin will destroy you. It will wound you. And the wounds that he received were because he decided to leave a place of blessing and prosperity. Prosperity and safety for the attractions of the world. The fragrance of Jericho caught his attention. The world's always going to take you and beat you up. But Jesus says, I'll give you life. And so the priest walks by. He's, he's the guy that ministers unto the Lord. But he doesn't have time for this guy. He says, no, I got business to attend to. Can't touch him. He's dirty unclean this guy he must be a sinner what kind of a man whatever I can't I, can't, I got no use for that guy and he passes around him and a Levite who is a minister in the house of God and serves and works with the priest he sees that man and he passes by as well but the Bible says that the Samaritan comes by and begins to minister to him it says he had compassion on him what is a Samaritan what is a Samaritan we're Samaritans <laughs> what's a Samaritan no. Samaritan is somebody that was left in Samaria when captivity came to Israel. And the king left some of the Gentiles behind with the Jews to maintain the area, the cities, the lands, the walls, the properties, so that they would not fall into disrepair and the animals would not take them over and the weeds wouldn't take them over. And they begin to intermarry. That's all they had for children or wives for their children. So they married one another and they became half Jew, half Gentile. And the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them because, my goodness, they're intermarried. Whoa, dirty Samaritans. And the Gentiles are like, my goodness, we don't have any, want to have anything to do with these people. They're, they got Jewish blood in them. They were so segregated that they became an isolated community that was wanted and loved by no one. And the guy that understood hurt and rejection sees a guy laying on the side of the road, beat up. Robbed of his clothing, wounded, and, and everything the valuable in his life taken from him. His dignity gone. And he says, wow, I know what that feels like. And he begins to have compassion on him. You know why we, we help hurting people? Because we understand what it's like to hurt. We know hurt. We can identify with hurt. We've been bruised. We've been wounded. Life, sin has, had, has taken its toll on us. We, sin destroyed our lives. And when we see somebody bruised and abused and broken and without the robe of righteousness and hurting, we don't look at them in condemnation and say, boy, they left Jerusalem. They're going to Jericho. They deserve this. We look at them and say, my goodness, I was that man. That was me. That was me. Hello, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short. No, there is none righteous. No, not one. There are no righteous 
priests in this house that can say, well, <laughs> if he'd have done it right, he'd be all right. No judgment in this. Nobody looking at you saying, well, you sure did mess up and make a mess of your life, didn't you? You, you deserve to be hurting right now. Let's see how long you can hurt. And, and, and if you hurt for a little while, maybe, maybe you'll, you'll learn from your mistakes. No. No, no. You know what he did? He took the oil and the wine, which is a type of joy and the spirit, and he poured it into his wounds. He ministered to the wounds of that hurting man, and he took him and he picked him up, and he put him on his own beast, and he carried him to the inn, which is a type of the church. This is a type of Jesus. And he gave him to the pastor. He gave, handed him over to the innkeeper, and he said, here's two pence. Here's two days' wages. You know, Jesus rose early on the third day. And he says to the innkeeper, I'm coming back. And whatever it costs you beyond this too, I'll repay. Hallelujah. Jesus restored that man and he told the pastor it whatever it costs you there's no price too great if you spend more than this go ahead whatever it costs you invest it into making this man well I'll pay you back whatever it takes for us to help hurting people whatever price we got to pay whatever kind of investment we got to make whatever we got to pay to make it happen if we're going to reach them with the gospel it's going to cost us something but Jesus says if it costs you more I'm going to pay it back when I come because he's returned early on the third day and he's coming back and he's going to restore everything that was taken Amen. whatever you spend more when I come again I will repay you don't worry that two days wages you know the day with is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day Jesus was crucified in the you know let's just say around 30 AD 33 AD, whatever. Let's just say it was around that time. Now, here we are approaching the year 2030. The second day is coming to a close. And Jesus is coming early on the third day. Can y'all sense that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh? Jesus is coming soon, folks. If you're going to get in to the house of God and get restored, now's the time to get restored. If you're going to be right with God, now's the time to be right with God because he's still pouring in oil and wine. There's coming a day when no man can work, no man can be saved, and when the end comes, it's over. But until that time, there's oil and wine being poured into the wounds and the bruises. And he says, whatever you got to pay to make it happen, pay it! You know what Jesus said? Store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt it. Don't store up your treasures on earth. You know, if your goal is to accumulate, 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 accumulate stuff, then you know what's going to happen to it? Somebody else is going to blow it. But if your goal is to accumulate in the kingdom of God, put your treasure where your heart is. Amen. Put it in the kingdom of God. Put it into the work of God. Don't put your treasure into natural things that destroy. Invest into restoring hurting people. Amen. Amen. He invested in his life. Calvary, we have a mission to help hurting people reach their full potential in Christ. Not their full potential in this life. Their full potential in Christ. We're not here to just make their lives better, pay their bills, and give them cars and houses and lands and fields. We're here to help them reach their full potential in Christ by serving with excellence. You know, the word excellent is not really used in the Bible. The closest word in the Bible to excellence, you know what it is? Virtue. The word virtue is excellence. What does the word virtue mean? Well, it means excellence. It means, let me read it to you, excellence, goodness, valor, brave deeds, excellence of character. These are all definitions of the word virtue. Literally means excellence of character. The word literally means excellence of character. When Peter spoke to us, 
He said, God has called us to his glory and excellence of character. And if you shall do these things, you shall never fail. We're not here to be slipshod about our relationship with God. We're here to serve with excellence. You know what God has called us to do? God has called us to serve lost humanity. You know how you fulfill your calling? First of all, you need to understand this. Your authority comes from your calling. When God called you, he gave you authority to fulfill the call. And your authority, number one, begins with the call of God on your life. And he says, we have been called to glory and to virtue. The first thing God does when he calls you is he gives you the power to live a righteous and holy and upstanding life. Holiness is excellence. Righteousness is excellence. Godliness, it's excellence. When we serve with excellence, when we do what's excellent, when we live this mission statement, we are doing the right things. We're living an excellent lifestyle. We're living without repute, ill repute. We're not, we're not living a lifestyle that's condemnable. When people look at us, they ought to be able to see Jesus inside of us. Why? Because we're serving with excellence. You know how else you gain authority? You gain authority by serving other people. The scripture says this, amen, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The word stature can mean many things. It can mean height. And I'm sure Jesus grew at 12 to 30 in height. But that's not what it's particularly talking about here. It's talking about the stature of a man is his character. It's who he is as an individual. Amen. The word stature is used elsewhere in the Bible to teach us that we are to grow in stature, grow in character, grow in godliness, grow in holiness. If you're not growing in stature with God and men, you're missing the boat on your potential. But we're going to reach our full How many of you want to reach your full potential in Christ? Amen. There's more to serving God than just coming to the house of God, lifting up your hands and singing praises and hearing a message. There is personal development that is required to be your best amen to fulfill your purpose amen we must be people that learn how to serve our fellow man love God and people there is no higher way of demonstrating true love than to be kind to another we're to be kind and if you're not kind yet, then you're still growing. But if you're kind, add to brotherly kindness, agapeo, unconditional, unselfish, full of God love. Add to your quiver, add to your fruitfulness, the love of God. Amen. And let God begin to manifest himself through us. This is what Peter's teaching today. Amen. So excellence is to go above and beyond. When we talk about serving with excellence, we're not just talking about how well we play the keyboard and how well we vacuum the floors and how well we do everything and perfectionism. Excellence and perfectionism is not the same thing. We're not here to criticize people because they didn't do it perfect. We're here to say, we got to raise the bar on our personal life, and I've got to become everything God wants me to be. I've got to serve with excellence. I, I cannot maintain my current level. I've got to grow. I've got to grow. I've got to grow. I've got to serve. I, it's, it's what I live for. It's why I exist. Jesus, he says, the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He said, I didn't come here. To, he's, in fact, he said, he that wants to be the greatest among you or desires to be first is going to be the slave of all. The greatest person in the room is the one that respects everyone else and serves them the most. So what do you want today? Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Or are you just looking to, to get 
recognition from people for personal accomplishment. No, you gain authority when you serve people. You grow in favor when you serve God and you serve people. You grow in stature when you serve God and when you serve people. You grow in wisdom when you serve God and when you serve people. We don't grow by benefiting us. We grow by giving of us. For God so loved the world that he gave. Giving is love. When you get a revelation of giving, you get a revelation of God. When you stop being selfish with your personal life and your possession, your time, your talent, your treasure, and your thinking, and you start giving yourself to God in all ways, you start loving God in all your heart, your passion, your loves, soul, your desires, your appetites, mind, your thoughts, your strength, your physical abilities. When we start loving God with everything we have, we start giving. And you know who we give to? Everyone. We start serving people. We take of our time and we teach Bible studies, whether we get paid to do it or not. And who cares if you get paid to teach a Bible study? You're not doing it because you get paid. You're doing it because you're trying to reach the lost. The only reason you get paid is so you don't have to worry about doing something else to provide food on the table for your family. You're out there reaching a world. Dear God, can we get past money and start realizing it takes money to move the gospel? And the more money we've got, the more gospel we can move. Amen. It takes a revival of finances to have a mighty move of God. Amen. And in the, if you want to get biblical New Testament, if you don't think 10%, if you think 10% is too much, then in the New Testament, they sold every everything they had and they laid it at the apostles feet take your choice sell it all and come and bring it up here or just you know give God back that 10 percent plus offerings yeah you've robbed him in tithes and offerings you wonder why you're not blessed financially you wonder why you're always struggling always having difficulties always got holes in your pockets it's because you haven't caught a vision to give into the kingdom You haven't got the revelation that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And you're trying to hang on to all your possessions and you're squeezing the life out of them. If you would start releasing and sowing, taking that seed and sow, you got to, you got to learn how to sow. You can't, you can't reap a harvest if you can't, if you don't sow a crop. And if all you're doing is consuming your seed, you're not getting a harvest. You can't consume seed and get a harvest. You got to sow seed. You got to put seed out to the elements. You got to stick it out in the dirt. And God says, I'm going to bring an increase on that. In fact, I'm going to open the windows of heaven. And I'm going to pour out so much blessing that you won't even have enough room to contain it. Dear God, give us a revelation of spiritual blessing tied to physical value. Until we get that revelation, we are going to live with a poverty mindset. And a poverty mindset says there's never enough. I gotta hang on to it. I gotta keep it. I gotta grow it. I gotta save it. I gotta. Blah, 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 blah. You know what you gotta do? You gotta learn how to give it. It doesn't mean that you need to be wasteful or 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 lack uh, uh, discretion or or be um, uh, uh, a lack of wisdom. If you if you have not provided for your family, you're worse than an infidel. And so you take care of your family, but you take care of God said, take care of my house first. Then you take care and I'll make your house full. He said, you take care of my house. And that's why this, that's why everything you see here exists. Why? Somebody had a vision. Dear God, somebody had a vision. How many of you remember Brother Monks? Amen. Brother Monks had a vision to give. He, he took up some of the greatest offerings this church had ever seen. Brother Monks was one of the biggest givers. He had a heart to give. Sister Monks, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. For all that you guys have given over the years. Brother Monks would give everything he had away. This building's here because of Brother Monks' offerings and sacrifice. This building that we're sitting in today was a vision of Brother Monks's because he ran our building fund drives. 
And we raised and we saved and we, we pulled it together and we did everything we could. And when we bought this building, we had $600,000 cash that we could put down on this house so that we could buy it and sell the old building. And now we got a plan. We got 12 acres out on Sooner Road. And Lord will, in one of these days, we need the finances. In 2005, it was going to cost $6 million to build this size facility. How many of you believe God's got more than $6 million in 2023? How many of you believe God's got a $20 million facility out on Sooner Road, if the Lord wills? Come on, we got to get a bigger vision. We got to realize we need to, we need to put that money into the kingdom of God. We got, we got $1.5 million stuck away and making 5% interest or something right now. Why? Because one of these days we got to build a building. Where's your vision at? Come on. God's going to raise up a church that's going to be blessed, and your houses are going to be blessed. Your families are going to be blessed. Your children are going to be blessed. Your children, our kids, are going to be standing in that pulpit preaching. This was our pastor's vision, that we were going to have a $20 million building, and we were going to have everything that we needed. Now let's build another building to the glory of God if he so wills it. Or buy every building in the city. God's got a vision, but it takes people get it done. Do we believe God's going to use us? You know, God's going to take your, you know, you know, this church was built literally on the income of fixed income. Many of our young, our, our elders were fixed income. Sister Morgan has given so much on fixed income, faithful people, and God has blessed her and God has blessed you. How many of you have been blessed by God? Brother Monks, I taught this lesson in 2016. We wrote the mission statement. We sat down. We said, what is Calvary? What, who are we? What, why do we exist? What embodies this church? Turn the volume up on that computer. Brother Monks, was, I was standing right here. And this was in 2016, I believe. And I'm April or something like that, May. I was sitting right about where you are, Brother Dylan. And, uh, and he stood up. And he said these words. I mentioned a few weeks ago how I appreciated how this church has been healing to us. Healing to us. Real recently, as we were trying to clear it up um, a little bit with the muddiness of make the our move back to this area, we want, we want to uh, uh, be here permanent. Recently, my oldest son Take some of the low end advised down. me, you know, and, uh, he says, you need to forget a lot of these other things and uh, I mean, spend the rest of your life in, in, in serving and giving and doing what's important. There's nothing more important than serve it. Nothing more important than than uh, fulfilling our mission, his purpose in life. And he sat down. He said, "There's nothing more important than fulfilling his purpose, our mission, than serving." There's nothing more important. He said, my boys advised me, take care of your life's business so you can give your whole life to serving people. And he sat down and he died. He laid his head over on Sister Monks' shoulders and he was gone. Uh, he died. He preached his last message. And he sat down in the house of God. But he passed on a legacy. This is his legacy. He was this man's pastor when he came into the church. This was his legacy. He sat down in this building 
and he died. And he said, there's nothing more important than serving. Dear God, give us a revelation of the most valuable thing we could ever do in life. It's not accumulate, but it's serve. It's give. It's pour our lives out. It's give to the call. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house so strong. Amen. Come on, we ought to, we ought to lift up our voices right now and begin to cry out to God. Amen. Come on, He's got a purpose for your life. He's got a vision for your life. He's got a mission for us as a church. We must be constrained. Jesus said, how, amen. He says, I've got a job to do, amen. And how I am constrained until I accomplish it. He literally said, I've got tunnel vision. He literally said, I've got one thing on my mind. He didn't even marry because he was so focused on the vision and the purpose that God had for his life. He had one mission, one vision. And we as a church have got to come to the revelation that we have the same vision and we have the same mission. Everything we do, everything we do in word or deed, we're going to do it all to the glory of Jesus Christ. We're going to do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody recognize we got a mission and a vision today? Come on, Calvary. Amen. I would to God that the Holy Ghost would begin to fall in this house right now and that everybody would get a fresh revelation of the mission. You're called to serve. You're on this earth to serve with X. You're not here just to accumulate and build and, and accumulate and build and accumulate. You're here to give. And God says, if you give, I will give back to you, pressed down, shaken together. Just try me on it. He says, just prove me. Just test me on this one. Does anybody feel the burden of God? you got a vision for your life, a mission for your life. Go into all the world and reach God's people. Would to God we get a greater revelation of why we're here. Get a vision for your life. Get a vision. Come on, embrace the mission. Come on, that's why some of you are bored with church and, and you don't have any purpose in life and, and you just want to play games. You've lost your vision. You don't have a mission. You don't even know where you're at. Turn your spiritual GPS on. Come on, church, lift up your voice. Would to God, we would all, if you want to embrace this mission, come on, let's come together. If you want to embrace the vision of God for your life, the mission of, the, of this church, come on, we're a part of this. I want all of Calvary up here. Come on, Calvary, let's go after what God has for us. Come on, Calvary, let's accomplish the mission. Come on, Calvary, we're not in this alone. We're in this together. We're in this until Jesus comes. Come on, Calvary, we've got work to do. from the oldest to the youngest, from the one that's been here for a few days to the one that's been here for 35 years. We have work to do. We got people to love. We got hurting people to help. It's not about us. It's about the mission. It's about the mission. That's why we build ministries. That's why we teach Bible studies. It's why we run a Sunday school program with excellence. It's why we have a youth program that's taken 87 people to Congress. It's because we have a mission. Dear God, awaken our soul, awaken our spirit, awaken us, give us a vision beyond who we are, where we are. Let us see where we are and where we need to go. Speak. I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to you right now. Come on, begin to talk to God. Let him talk to you. I feel the Holy Ghost. Take your neighbor by the hand and begin to pray with him if it's appropriate. Men with men, ladies with ladies, husbands and wives, begin to pray for one another right now. Let the Spirit of God minister. We got a mission. Are you going to die and say, I gave my life to service? Come on, Brother Monks' legacy lives on in every servant, in every servant of the Lord, in everyone that's willing to help somebody that is hurting. Come on, church. 
Come on, church. We got work to do. We got work to do. We got a mission. We got a vision until everybody in our city, amen, has had an opportunity to receive the word of the Lord. Until everybody in our city has had a Bible study, we have work to do. Go ahead, lift up your voice. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody, well, go ahead. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray with passion. Pray with fire. Pray with zeal. Pray with understanding. Hallelujah. Come on, add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith excellence. Add to your faith serving with excellence. Hallelujah. We're going higher. We're growing in God. We're going to be the men and women God has called us to be. We have a purpose. We have a purpose. His purpose is our purpose. Come on, lift up your voice, church. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. God is speaking. There's a spirit of revelation in this room. Come on, don't, don't, don't walk out of this room right now. Can we linger in the presence of God for a moment? Can we linger in the presence of God for a moment? Come on, nobody leave for a moment right now. Can we walk in the Holy Ghost? Can we pray in the Holy Ghost? Can we want respond to the Holy Ghost? Come on, resources are coming into your life. Opportunities are coming into your life. Amen. Businesses are coming into your life. Business owners are coming into your life because God has a purpose. He's got to reach the world. His vision, His mission. Come on, men of Calvary, rise up. Come on, women of Calvary, rise up. Come on, Calvary. This is our vision. This is our mission. God. Until it be accomplished. How are we straightened until the mission be accomplished? How are we constrained? We got tunnel vision. We got tunnel vision. It's the kingdom of God. 
is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Come on, I want to die serving. I want to die giving. I want to give my life for the cause, for the mission, for the purpose. It's worth living for because it's worth dying for. We give our lives for your purpose. Come on, Calvary. Come on, Calvary. Let's go to the next level. Let's grow. Let's grow. Let's grow. Let's walk worthy of our calling. Let's walk worthy of the calling. Glory and virtue. Excellence in everything. Excellence in everything. Excellent spirit. Excellent attitude. Excellent walk with God. <laughs> Come on, we need some young men that get a burden for the loss. Some young men to catch a burden. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Nothing more important than serving, than serving, and giving, and pouring out. <laughs> 